Okay, we'll just give everybody 30 seconds to log in and then we will uh, we'll get going. I'd just like to quickly check the audio before we start with the session. If you can hear me and, um, and you can see the participants, uh, if you could type a Y in the chat box, that would be helpful. Good stuff. Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening. My name is Patrick Munley. I've been active in the financial markets for the past 15 years as a money manager, mentor, and currently a resident market expert at Tickmill. My role today is hosting and moderating our discussion. We hope today's debate will provide insight into the impact of potential outcome scenarios of the US election. Our aim today is to cut through the noise of the campaign rhetoric and the polling data and provide you with actionable insights, identifying themes that will impact a broad range of markets over the coming weeks, months, and even years. Before we jump into the hot topics for debate, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. We've amassed a cross-section of market technicians, traders, and even the odd CEO to provide a cross-section of not just conventional, but also contrarian views. So firstly, I'd like to welcome Sudanashu Agarwal, Executive Director and CEO of Tipmill. Shu has been managing and advising trading firms over the past 15 years. He's currently burning the midnight oil and dialing in from Sydney, Australia. How are you doing, Shu? Pretty good. Yes. Thank you. Joining Shu from Singapore is Desmond Lung. Desmond is Tickmill's Asian market expert and CEO of EFG and Forex Army, award-winning research businesses, advising trading desks of banks, hedge funds, and treasury departments. How are you doing, Desmond? I'm good, thank you. Good. And from the Middle East, we have Joseph Dahir calling in from the Lebanon. Joseph has nearly a decade-long track record in various roles within the capital markets. Joseph is currently a market strategist for Tickmill with specific expertise in Elliott Wave analysis. How are you doing, Joseph? Very good, Patrick, thank you. Excellent. Now from Europe, we have Mike Sidel dialing in from Germany. Mike has been involved in the markets for over 20 years, trading full-time for the past eight years. He is currently CEO and founder of Investor Schuler, where he coaches traders of all experience levels. Mike actively trades Forex indices and individual stocks. Guten Tag, Mike. Hello. I'm good to be here and looking forward to this great event today. Thank you. Excellent. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Carlos Valedra calling in from Madrid in Spain. Carlos has been a full-time market operator since 2009. His approach is based on supply and demand, price action, and the psychology that moves markets. He has experience in training traders and investors from retail to professional traders. He has served as an international currency dealer for fintech companies across Europe. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into our first topic for discussion. Before we do, I'd like to suggest that if you have any questions regarding topics discussed during the session, please save those for the end of the discussion where I'll open up the floor to a Q&A session. So I guess before we can think about uh, the outcome of the election, we have to think really about the results. Republican President Donald Trump has questioned the validity of mail-in votes, raising concerns that the results of one or more states will be decided in the courts. Trump again declined to commit to accepting the results during the presidential debates, repeating his unfounded complaint that mail-in ballots would lead to election fraud. That has bolstered the case for investors betting on markets staying volatile into and post the election. So an orderly election versus a delayed result. How would a contested result impact the markets in your view? And I think we'll, uh, we'll let Mike start us off there in, uh, in giving his view on that. Mike? Uh, yes, I'm here. Great. <laughs> so nice, guys. And maybe um, uh, thank you for the time here uh, in this um, yeah, discussion. And I would like to give you some of the points um, to uh, the first thing that you was talking about, um, the election. Um, and I'm, I would like to make it short. I'm, I would say 
um, I have the expectation um, that just for the case uh, that um, Trump uh, will not win the election, um, he will go to the court um, and uh, making it through a process. And I think he's prepared for this because of um, his insult, um, uh, the lady in the court uh, that we expected. And this is normal thing um, that uh, occurred after the election, but this time is everything different. And I think he's prepared um, for this lawsuit. And I'm, I'm pretty sure just for the case, um, Trump will not win. We will see a, a delayed uh, e election state and uh, we will have to wait for a great volatility on the markets. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, just today, actually, Amy Coney Barrett is going to be um, sworn in as the ninth member of the Supreme Court. She will actually mean that the court now is stacked six to three in the conservative favor. So there are genuine concerns that um, as we do, if we do go to a contested election, that Trump at the very last minute would have stacked the deck in his favor. So um, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good point you raised there, Mike. Um, Desmond, do you have uh, any, any thoughts to share with us on this topic? Uh, right now, yeah, it, it seems that almost everyone expect, uh, expects Trump to, you know, to contest the result unless he wins, right? And more on that probability later, right? Um, what we do know for sure is that you know, a contested result will likely cause periods of extreme volatility and indecision. But what I think is more interesting, um, more interesting is how we can take advantage of this, um, particularly from a, you know, from a trading perspective. You know, since, since there's going to be a huge amount of uncertainty, you know, what is, we can ask ourselves, right? Um, what is one thing we can be certain about? And, and to me, that is, uh, we can be, certain about uncertainty right and if you're thinking yeah you know if you're thinking about it from a trading perspective right i will be looking at um you know for all the other traders in this uh in this room right i'll be looking for patterns of indecision i'll be i'll be looking at periods where the markets might be ranging you know there'll be a horizontal channels you know big levels big pivot levels that require a lot of like concentrated effort to break through you know, I'll be trying to take a little bit more of those contrarian traits, reversal traits around these key levels. And it all revolves around the whole idea that, you know, from the election and if it goes into, uh, if it gets contested, right, there'll be just this big period of indecision. And instead of trying to guess which way the direction the, the markets might hit, it might make more sense for us to, you know, to, to, to play that uncertainty, right? And, and yeah, so that, that's kind of my view on it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, from uh, from from the FX market, uh, with respect to um, volatility and options in terms of volatility, um, there has been a, a steep decline of volatility coming into the election. But I know I, I was reading just before we came on today that um, that market makers are starting to price in quite a bit of volatility now over the election night, similar to 2016, really, where we got some big moves that were quickly reversed. So that idea of, I guess, if we do get a clear winner on the evening, maybe we will see some, some directional moves that test these current range resistance or support areas. And like you say, um, they could be faded uh, with, with some success. So uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's some good input. Thanks for that, Desmond. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, don't, I don't know if just yet, do we have Carlos on the line? No, I don't think we do. Okay. Um, well, let's move on. So once we get past the election and we have a, a, a potential new tenant in the White House, um, we want to think about what, what the implications are going to be, either from the Democrat or the Republican side. And one of the key areas is that of the tax and regulatory environment. Under the current administration, just last week, the Justice Department announced an investigation into Google's monopoly abuse of the internet. And while there are fears of rising t tax rates under a Biden administration that could also hit these large technology stocks that have really been responsible for leading the market rally this year, are investors now looking to book gains before potential tax increases take place? Although markets typically welcome new spending initiatives, those proposed by Democratic candidates are likely to be accompanied by those higher corporate taxes. Among other proposed taxes on the US-based multinational companies is an increase in the US corporate tax rate, potentially from 21% to 28%, which could result in the average company seeing after-tax profits fall by 10%. In your view, what are the main tax and regulatory implications under the two potential candidates? And what's the key trade in terms of a takeaway from there? Uh, Joseph, do you want to start us off with that? Yes, Patrick, thank you. 
Um, in my opinion, taxation is a very important uh, topic to speak of uh, in regard to the capital markets. So basically, uh, we all may know that the Democrats prefer the higher taxation strategy, as always. And uh, Trump like kept the, the rate at the moment the same, like 37% for the, for the income tax or the individual tax and 21% for the uh, corporate tax. Biden is willing to, to raise these taxes from 37% for the, for the individual taxes to 39.6, and from 21% for the income tax, for the corporate tax, excuse me, to 28%. So basically, in Biden's opinion, and according to Tax Policy Center, uh, the tax proposal of Biden will increase revenues by $4, $4 trillion between the years 2021 and 2030. So basically, what, what Biden is trying to do is to uh, try to prioritize fairness and try to be more protective to the, to the middle class, all right? But however, we, we all know that the multi, multinational uh, companies' profits would decrease, speaking of higher taxation. So uh, that's why if, if, we, if we correlate the taxation to, to the stock market, no doubt, no doubt that the correlation between, between tax revenues and the stock market has increased noticeably encouraging, of course, the revision of the current approach of the uh, fiscal policy. So, so basically, low taxation means higher income to the multinational companies, thus more liquidity invested in the stock market. So this is actually bullish for stocks. And higher taxation means lower spending and low income, thus affecting the liquidity. Of course, this is bearish for stocks. So in my opinion, and as a small uh, conclusion uh, on taxation, uh, if Trump gets reelected, we can see new record highs on uh, the American indices and a drop if Biden wins. This is basically the uh, correlation between the taxation and yeah. the stock market if the Democrats and the Republican wins. So basically, Good point. It's positive for Trump and negative for uh, the Democrats. Good point. Uh, Shu, do you want to chime in on uh, the, the regulatory and tax environment? Yeah, I think um, yeah, Joseph's uh, presented a really good point, uh, but I guess what we really need to figure out is that there's going to be probably four potential scenarios. Are we looking at a blue wave? Um, you know, which means that uh, Biden comes in um, and so does um, the House um, change um, hands. Or are we looking at, um, you know, Biden coming in with um, the House still remaining um, uh, with the Republicans? And um, so, so there's, and then there's there's the other possibility is that um, you know Trump stays and and so does his uh, house, or um, most unlikely that Trump would stay and um, the house would go to the Democrats. Um, again, then then there comes in uh, you know uh, business seems to have preferred um, the Republicans because um, they're not as uh, the regulatory environment becomes a bit. Um, easier and more business focused um, from and then again the tax tax implications uh, with the whole COVID situation uh, which has to be addressed as well is do you provide a stimulus first or do you provide tax cuts um, you know which it's a chicken and egg um, I'm glad I'm not you know part of the um, Part of the decision-making process out there, but then you know you, you've got to run a balancing act between tax, stimulus, um, probably even social welfare has to be taken into account. So there's a lot of um, uncertainty, and and regardless of who wins, um, I guess the first um, till the end of January, uh, Trump still stays in house. Uh, he still has executive powers. Um, he can still make a lot of decisions. And I think reflecting back to the previous discussion where you have um, yeah, um, now the balance of the Senate, or, or I mean the uh, judicial powers uh, stacked nine to three, um, there's a lot that could happen. Um, so I guess regardless of who wins, um, I think one of the economists I was listening to rightly put it, there's probably going to be more questions post-election, post-November 3, then there are going to be answers. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that, is, that is certainly one of the scenarios that I think has spooked the markets, that um, if, we, if, for example, Biden does win, like you say, we still do have 
another um, another nearly two months of a Trump administration. And you've got to wonder at that stage in terms of fiscal policy, what sort of um, state or what sort of economy that Trump would want to hand over to Biden? Because there's a view that um, certainly from Mitch McConnell, the, lead, uh, the leader of the Republicans, is that he doesn't want to get into a stimulus bill now because he's of the view of, or, or the, the polling is suggesting that Biden comes in and what he'd rather do is hand almost a, a stillborn economy to, to Biden to take over that's in a, a complete <laughs> shambles. And, you know, there's, the, the gamesmanship is, is, is never ending. Um, in terms of gamesmanship, that, that brings us on really to uh, another important question, and that's really to do with uh, the ongoing and seemingly never ending uh, trade relations saga. Um, on August the 15th, China and the US agreed to postpone a review of their phase one trade deal. The US election campaign and the hard rhetoric from President Trump could exacerbate tensions with negative spillover effects. The equally hawkish tone from the members of the Democratic Party brings new policy uncertainties to the bilateral relationship in a Biden win scenario. Meanwhile, transatlantic relations have deteriorated significantly since the election of Trump. Uh, the common values on which uh, Europe and the US have built their relationships since World War II in terms of democracy, respect for human rights, free trade, are no longer really promoted by the Trump administration. And then in the UK, we have the Brexit saga and uh, emblematic of the different approaches between Trump and Biden. President Trump supported the UK's decision to leave the EU and expressed doubts about the future viability of the EU even. He supported a free trade agreement with the UK after its, with, after its withdrawal. And then on the other hand, Joe Biden's team has warned Boris Johnson that the Northern Ireland protocol with the EU should not be challenged. Otherwise, the UK and US trade treaty would also be compromised. So in light of this, for both Europe and China, the results of the US presidential election will be as important as they are almost for the United States. So what do you see as the principal drivers for trade relations with the likes of China and the EU and a post-Brexit UK? And how would this read into the FX pricing versus the dollar in those major financial centers? And so for that, I would like Joseph to, uh, to jump back in. Yes, Patrick. Uh, speaking of the tensions, let me start highlighting the, of course, the US-China tensions dash relation, uh, which in my opinion will never go back to where it was before. So basically Trump presented himself uh, to the world as he, he is the only person capable of putting China under submission. Since then, he is imposing the tariffs and fighting the big tech companies. So basically, Trump is expected to continue this strategy that is likely to raise tensions. While uh, Trump's approach is likely to place more immediate pressure on, on China. So basically, if Trump wins, these tensions will definitely, definitely continue to escalate. Um, Biden is seen by others as more predictable and comprehensive. So uh, in addition, Biden like slammed the trade war with China, saying that tariffs have hurt American businesses and consumers. Still, he called the US to get tough on China. So, um, and uh, uh, you mentioned the US trade deficit maybe. He highlighted as well that the US trade deficit with China has only grown since Trump has made the trade deal uh, with China in January. So in general, I, I don't think the US elections outcomes per se make things infinitely better for China, it probably makes it a little bit less volatile, uh, in my opinion. So for, for the US-UK deal, um, many of the members, members of the Congress and analysts uh, questioning the sequence of the talks to the extent that the United States uh, may face difficulty negotiating with the UK without knowing what the, what the final UK-EU relationship looks like. So. Trump winning may, may extend the negotiations even more, possibly reaching a deal with UK. Uh, there's a phrasing that, uh, that, uh, that is related to the Northern Irish peace to be a victim of, of Brexit. Um, Trump has developed close ties to Johnson, but Biden's warning suggests may not do the same. So this signals to me that the special relationship between a Biden administration um, and Boris Johnson uh, government, especially, in a no-deal Brexit is not going to be very special, in my opinion. But uh, as you mentioned, the, the relation to the dollar index, uh, uh, have you mentioned, Patrick, the, the correlation of these tensions to the dollar index? Um, no, we are going to, uh, we're going to move on to that shortly. Right. I was All specifically right. thinking about um, not just the dollar index, but, you know, in terms of if we're looking at the relationship between the US and 
um, either a President Biden or a President Trump, and post-Brexit, how that might impact the sterling dollar um, dynamics, or in terms of the EU, what we see in terms of, like we've seen um, in, in previous months, really, when Trump has amped up the rhetoric in terms of uh, the trade negotiations, that's had a tendency to, to weigh on the euro. Um, and so it's really trying to think in terms of the specific currencies. I mean, we've recently seen the dollar um, very strong against the Chinese yuan, got a bit of a turnaround yesterday in that. And it's thinking about how these independent financial centers, their currencies may respond. I believe we've got Carlos joining us now. Carlos, can you hear us? Yes. Hello, everybody. Hi, How are you, Hi. everybody? I'm sorry we have some technical problems. No problem at all. Carlos, do you want to um, to jump in and give any perspective you have on that? Yeah, sure. I don't know. I mean, um, I think Trump is selling this US-China uh, agreement like some kind of victory. I agree with Joseph that it tends to make things more stable, but actually, China, we know that it's maybe not going to, you know, to, to actually do the agreement is not gonna deliver the what has been agreed already it's not gonna deliver it so trump is using it for his political um, campaign making like uh, i make peace with korea i make peace with china we have everything under control putin is my friend but actually he has a really big problem with this because china is buying a lot of uh, products from uh, USA. So uh, at the moment, China cut this thing. Um, America is going to have some problems. We can you, we can see that in the past, uh, soy producers uh, attack a, a little bit Trump because of this, no? And he needed to put a solution immediately when we have this problem immediately. So and the concern for me also is that if you see the dollar yuan is going down steady from seven to 6.7 already. <clears throat> so China is getting more buying power all the time. It's getting more buying power. So I think it's not, the, um, as Joseph says, I agree that uh, it's not something that is already clear, the China and USA agreement, because uh, nothing is going to guarantee that China is going to comply 100% with the agreement, in my opinion. That's, good. That's a good point. This, uh, this move in the WAN is, is helping China to achieve those, uh, those buying obligations at a, 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 at a discount, really. Desmond, what, what were your thoughts on this? Well, I guess regardless if, if Biden or Trump gets in, right, both regiments, they'll be, uh, they'll, they'll be China exchange rate hawks. Right, and I think they will, we will see that they will insist that the exchange rate ref, um, adjust to reflect the the bilateral kind of trade imbalances, right? So, so we, we all know that previously the the yuan, right, it depreciated when the two countries were you know undergoing fierce tensions and stuff, right? But I think this year, right, um, a dovish you know central bank, right, uh, you know there's undecided uh, fiscal aid. Right, and I think it's putting a little bit of a lead on the U.S. But if you really look at China, right, uh, the PBOC has actually shown a more open stance towards the yuan appreciation. You know, as the country has kind of reduced its um, reliance on exports, right. So, so you know, kind of like taking a step back, you know, in a nutshell, right, there are the fundamentals that are favoring the yuan, yeah. and you know, the uh, PBOC is you know much more tolerant on yuan appreciation, a lot more flexibility there you know and if there's absence of any like uh, further es escalation of us you know china tensions in the short term you know we could actually see the yuan you know uh, strengthen uh, strengthen over the uh, the rest of the year or even 2020 uh, 2021 my personal my personal take from it if i look at it from a trading perspective right i think the yuan could strengthen at least 5% more potent in 2021. So what that means in trading perspective is that uh, dollar CNH, you know, I could actually be seeing it go all the way down to 6.35, 6.4, you know, if nothing other than to maintain the peace on the trade war fronts, right? And, and you know, if you, uh, of course, you know, from a trader perspective, you know, if you're showing the, the UN gravitational pull theory, that could levitate the euro dollar up to 1.2 or 1.25. Right, so, so really just broadly looking at this, you know, seeing what the potential kind of trading opportunities, you know, uh, uh, traders in the room here uh, can be looking out for. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good point because as the, uh, as the Yuan uh, does, uh, does come off, then you can start to see these uh, you know, Chinese investment funds move into the euro. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, the, the other elephant in the room is actually the Swiss National Bank and, um, and their never-ending battle to, um, to defend the, uh, the Swiss francs. I mean, you've got a lot of um, cross-border capital flows that could drive some, some seismic shifts in the markets post the election. Mike, what do you think? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we have spoken about um, a few very important things, but it, when I think about um, USA and China, um, I just have in mind um, a few things. It's it's uh, not not too complicated, um, but on the one hand, we have um, Donald Trump. He who would like um, uh, to sell a, a victory against China. He has on his policy. He would like to have a, a trade deal with China, and he's on the way on his way. Um, but at the end, um, I think. Um, China will win because of um, Trump has maximum for another years uh, and uh, China has much more time and I think uh, they know exact uh, about this thing and they have all the time in the world um, to do uh, an interaction with uh, the USA and uh, this year, next year, or in four years, I think it doesn't matter. And uh, just for the case uh, that Biden will win this um, this, this election, um, we have to know China and the USA have a relationship of a mutual uh, necessity. And um, China needs the USA, but USA needs China, I think, a bit more because of a lot of products that uh, US citizens buy or the companies buy. Um, um, uh, are produced in China and uh, even if these are um, products that are created uh, in the USA, um, a lot of these uh, things are produced in China and so um, it's a, it's a win-win situation um, for um, USA and China when they find a good way, a smooth way and um, this is um, the advantage uh, for the case um, that uh, Biden will uh, move into the White House, that um, Biden is more a fan of China and we will see, I think, a better chance uh, for a functional trade agreement between the USA and China uh, on this one hand. And the second one is even um, if we don't talk about um, China, we have also Europe, you mentioned it before, um, we have the Brexit and uh, USA is involved in both of them. Uh, and I'm pretty sure when Trump has finished um, the deal with, with China, he will go to Europe, he will go to Britain. Um, he was already talking with Boris Johnson and said, all right, when you leave um, the UK, you will you will get a great deal uh, from me, but uh, you have to know a great deal with uh, with, with Trump is is in the most cases a, a great deal for Donald Trump, um, <laughs> and this is what you should have in mind, and uh, this is what I have in mind, and so um, the Brexit is hard enough uh, for Great Britain, and I think we we can talk about um, um, a deal between USA and Great Britain maybe next year when we have an end uh, in the Brexit. Nobody knows what will happen. And uh, I think we have enough time for this and uh, then comes Europe. So that's that's my point of the view. Interesting. And, and Shu, you, your perspective out in Australia, where China is starting to apply some, uh, some trade restrictions out there at the moment. And um, certainly I would think if, if Trump starts to bear down on China, then China will look to flex their muscles elsewhere, and your little uh, your little part of paradise could be under pressure. Uh, well, our little part of paradise is already under pressure, um, but I think um, I echo uh, Mike's uh, sentiment. Um, you know, most of us live in a democracy where governments are turned every four to five years. Um, China is has got a fifty year plan. Um, you know, the last time I was in Shanghai, um, the airport had uh, 50 counters. Six of them were operational. And I thought it was because it was um, probably arrived at the wrong time of the day. Uh, so I just asked them and they said, well, no, this was built for 2050. <laughs> um, so, so they've got a 50 year plan. Um, I don't think any dem democratic government can even think about a 50 year plan. Um, so, um, you know, I, I completely echo what uh, Mike has said, um, regardless of who stays in the White House or who doesn't, um, you know, this trade deal will come uh, and then, you know, there will be another presidency and then there would be another trade deal. Yeah. Um, and the saga will go on. Uh, 
Britain has its own problems. Uh, they still don't know what kind of a Brexit it's going to be. Uh, so let them figure that out before they can, before that can come onto the table. Um, but I think um, from China's perspective, um, at least if I was sitting in the policy rooms, I would actually want the Trump administration to stay. Um, because as soon as you have a new administration, you then have um, a whole new set of people that you have to deal with, new set of relations that you have to build. And you know that's again, uh, a time-taking, painstaking exercise. Um, so if, um, you know, like I said, if I was there, I would, I would prefer the Trump administration. I would prefer the current administration to at least stay for another four years so that, you know, um, and not to say that, you know, Trump is all about Trump. I, I do agree with that as well, uh, you know, but um, he has done stuff. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's done some good stuff uh, in like in the Middle East. I mean, um, there's been some peace around. Um, we've had lesser sort of wars around the place, lesser troop movements and everything else. So, so there is good stuff that he has done. Um, so let's see what uh, the future holds. Okay. Well, thinking of China, and I guess thinking about um, Trump's perspective on, um, on the other major issue that's affected us all, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and his ongoing rhetoric of the, of the China flu, um, and the significant impacts throughout the world, the, the shutdown of global economies and leading to deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, be, uh, apparently beginning in China in the midst of a US election year, it's proven to be a very politically charged issue. Um, the USA has been especially hard hit by, by COVID-19 with more than 8 million uh, cases, more than any other country, with the recent death of um, Sup Supreme Court Justice uh, Ginsburg and the new newly appointed now, uh, Amy Bar Barrett Cohen, um, what we can, what, what I guess is going to, is going to be a major issue is, are we going to see a stimulus bill passed before the November election? Now, every day we're getting news on the wires that um, Mnuchin is speaking to Pelosi at two o'clock in the afternoon. They then report that the telephone call was 52 minutes and nothing happens, but we wait then for the next day and the next telephone call. Um, and so really it's thinking about, it is, is, is a fiscal stimulus approach likely to render just another sugar high, or is it the start of another sugar rush in terms of the markets? Or is there a sense of diminishing returns? We have Fed policy pushing its upper limits uh, within its current remit. Um, monetary policy advisors are, are now passing the baton to lawmakers who are obviously stymied by political posturing into the election. So I guess one of the key questions is, can any fiscal stimulus package at the moment really genuinely counter the pandemic problem and the socio-economic fallout that we're seeing uh, across the globe, and especially in America? Uh, Mike, I think you've got some input on that. Yeah, there, there are, there are part, a few points um, on my side um, because of COVID-19 um, is um, in both ways, uh, a mood booster and uh, a financial uh, or fiscal um, stimulus indicator. Um, and in my opinion, um, COVID-19 is much more important um, for the US economy, for the global economy, and much more important for the stability of the, of the, of the US dollar um, than the US election result. Because of um, when we have a look to um, the election programs, um, both presidents or the, the current president and maybe the next one, Mr. Biden, um, have a focus to the US economy. And uh, when you think about the US economy, um, then you have to, to think about um, the, the effects of uh, COVID-19 because of COVID-19 um, has shown lockdowns. We got mandatories. We got um, limitation shrink, uh, the shrinking the, the eco economy. All the things came from the COVID, and that had nothing to do with with, the, with Mr. Trump or um, with Mr. Biden. So, um, in this case, um, we have to look about um, how we can solve the problems uh, with COVID nineteen. 
and um, the problems are uh, higher unemployment, uh, lower um, overall expenditure. We have um, falling uh, corporate profits, and this is this is much more important than any tax things because of when um, our our the, the U.S. Um, corporates, uh, the U.S. companies earn less money, um, they have lower profits, and uh, when you have lower profits, it doesn't matter um, uh, what about the tax things are. The profits are important, and uh, this is a thing what. Uh, COVID-19 um, effects in a direct way. Yeah? And the next one is uh, liquidity constraints and low inflation pressure. These are uh, things in my mind um, that brings us worst case scenarios. That means um, consumer and corporate sentiments are unfavorable for the future. And this is a huge problem. And um, the government and the Fed um, will do everything to act against the negative impact. And it doesn't matter if Trump or Biden, um, the Fed will do anything or everything um, to keep uh, the system going. That means we will see huge stimulus programs and um, I know um, the the impact um, the uh, the stimulus program from the Rep from the uh, Republicans is a bit smaller uh, than the one from uh, from from. Um, from Biden's team, but at the end of the day, um, the Fed will have. Um, a huge, huge um, impact to the whole system. And um, the Americans call it um, Tina is back. Um, so they call it there is no alternative. And um, we, we, we see this, we have stimulus negotiations at the moment without any results, but we have we have it. And I'm pretty sure after the election, um, we will see new programs. We have the triple free program um, uh, to support um, the liquidity of the of the uh, companies in USA. We see bond purchase programs by the Fed and um, unemployment benefits uh, for, for, for the people living in America, um, just to bring them in the situation that you have, that they have always in enough money to pay their bills and uh, spend money um, uh, to buy products and anything else. And these are the things in my mind um, that we have to have in mind um, when we talk about COVID-19 and the result of the elections. Excellent. Good points, Mike. Okay, well, look, that's given us some, some context, I guess, and background to how we anticipate some of the, uh, the broader impacts of this election are going to be. So I guess what we want to do now in this final section is dial this down and start to think about um, specifically some of the key markets that I know many of the, uh, the uh, attendees today will be interested in getting your, your views on. And so firstly, I'm going to start by, by a quick deep dive into the dollar. Um, obviously, the dollar is experiencing a, a cyclical weakening over the last two years, the dollar bull market that had been supported by large interest rate differentials and above trend growth relative to the rest of the world. Um, since the pandemic induced recession, we've seen the removal of the twin pillars used to support the dollar, i.e. interest rate differentials and the US growth exceptionalism, replaced by the re-emergence of the twin deficits, especially the fiscal deficit. In addition to the Fed's long-term commitment to near zero rates and an escalating jet to, uh, debt to GDP ratio, this is undoubtedly gonna put further pressure on the reserve currency. So how do you guys see uh, outcome scenarios impacting the US dollar? Also wanna think in terms of G7 FX counterparts and even gold. Um, let's start, Dennis, do you wanna, uh, Desmond, sorry, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I have um, I, I do have a short point on this, I guess, right? Um, I guess one of the big outcome scenarios is, is definitely um, the stimulus, right? If there's one thing, if there's one sure thing, right, is that the stimulus is coming. You know, whether it's a, it's a blue wave for a democratic house cutting whatever deal uh, it can, or even if it's, if it's a Trump, you know, four more years, right? The stimulus is going to be very necessary as viewed through the lens of rising US initial jobless claims, uh, which only actually really become more painful towards the year end as, you know, um, state level unemployment stop gaps, you know, they start to fall under a little bit more pressure. So personally from me, Right. No matter who is going to win the election, the general direction for the dollar, you know, I'm expecting it to, to weaken, you know, due to the significant kind of money printing uh, that will be needed. And, and of course, you know, in turn, this would aid gold, right? So, so, so that view would more or less form my overall uh, bias for my, you know, longer term positions here, right? I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think everyone will probably have a view on this so I can let everyone else share, yeah. Good. Carlos, do you want to chime in? 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Desmond. I mean, before starting into giving my idea on the dollar, going back to what Mike said, uh, there is one important thing because the stimulus is coming, as uh, Desmond said, is coming. We know that. But it, we don't know what the next president uh, is going to be. It's impossible to know. But we know a couple of stuff, a couple of things that we can check looking at Europe. And we can know that more regulation, higher taxes, massive, massive government spending, they, that doesn't generate enough jobs. Um, it's not going to help the crisis. It doesn't mean that more spending and more stimulus, it, it doesn't necessarily mean more jobs. We need to, to keep, uh, keep this in mind because in Europe, we have been doing this since 2009. And we still are struggling, you know? So more spending or more, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, printing is not gonna help. But in my opinion, for me, the currencies, I, I'm very dollar. Um, I think it's gonna weaken as well. Uh, it's not actually not bad for USA to have a weaker dollar. It's gonna help become more competitive in the, uh, some uh, markets, so it's good, it's good. Uh, this is uh, actually one thing that Trump is doing that nobody uh, before uh, was doing like him, is uh, speaking directly to the Fed, speaking directly to, uh, to Powell and saying, China is doing um, currency manipulation and we are not doing it. They have an edge over us, over us. So basically uh, this put a lot of pressure down in, in my opinion on, on dollar. So I think I'm very dollar uh, printing machine is on 24 seven. And I think also important thing in the future is the debt sailing. Nobody is speaking about this, but I think in the future, in the next year, Remember with Obama, the trillion uh, debt sailing uh, stuff, we have to also, it was uh, on the news. So I think this in the future, it may be a problem. So far, uh, I'm bearish the dollar. Okay, good. Uh, Joseph? Patrick, for the US dollar, as Carlos and Desmond said, um, we are on the same team actually. So basically I will back it up by some uh, other points, bullet points. Uh, earlier this year, China devaluated the Chinese yuan against the dollar. And you saw the pair rising above the pivotal number, which is seven, the golden ratio. And after the accusation that Trump made uh, against China as a currency manipulator, we found that the stimulus program has started more and more to push in the USA and the, the interest rate cap near zero, 0, 0.25 basis point. And this is definitely a road of devaluation for the XY, for the dollar index. And we saw it actually drop from 103 to 93, which is the current level. So I believe uh, for the stimulus program, even if Trump was the one who halted the stimulus program uh, recently, however, I, I still believe he will adopt it as soon as he gets reelected. So, and in addition, uh, Desmond said uh, one thing that both ways, whoever wins the election, he sees a bearish US dollar. And in theory, uh, a Biden win could reduce the value of the greenback of, of, of the dollar even more, since he would likely spend more on stimulus both on COVID-19 relief and potentially on infrastructure, especially if there's a blue wave uh, that leads to, to, of course, the Democrats taking, taking over the, the Senate. Uh, so basically, in my, in my opinion, Biden presidency would boost more uh, blue chips, blue chip stocks, uh, more, uh, more than, the, than the dollar. So actually, eventually, this is not bad since a weaker dollar tends to make the US exports more attractive. Um, to overseas consumers and boosting the sales and profit for multinational companies, but it may not, it may not be in America's best interest uh, to see the dollar uh, value uh, skyrocket. That's why I believe more recovery is awaiting the major currencies like the euro, the pound, and the, all the FX currencies. And for the safe haven for the gold, I see another surge, maybe 10 to 20% coming in the medium to long-term view for the gold potential targeting $2,300, $2,500 an ounce, backed up by not only the stimulus program and the low interest rate, but what, with high level of inflation as well. Okay. okay. So that's three out of our five uh, panelists think that uh, the dollar's headed for, uh, for, the, for the ditches here. Mike, where, where, where are you sitting? <laughs> what I think, um, it's also pretty, uh, pretty simple. I'm the opinion, and um, the dollar will be weak for for, for a while longer. Um, I'm not really sure 
um, if you can see this, but it's it's uh, it's a few uh, um, I think a few months uh, uh, ago uh, in, in between. Ah, no, you can't see this. Sorry, um, I had a I had a chart for our um, German Tignal team um, where I was talking about um, the long term development of the Euro US dollar, for example, and um, you can see a, a sixteen year cycle, sixteen years of uh, increasing and sixteen years of decreasing um, time range, and um, it looks like. Um, we are in the in the next cycle um, that we see an increasing uh, euro against the, the US dollar. So what I think is um, that we will see um, for the for the for the next period. I don't know how long, but um, I expect uh, a weaker um, US dollar because of um, the US ad administration um, is doing a lot of work um, for uh, to 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 weaken the US dollar, and um, we have not enough time. Um, for to do this, uh, the, the Fed um, has said, right, we can do a lot of things. And uh, when you have a look into the balance sheet and compare um, this balance sheet from the from the Fed uh, with, with other balance sheets, uh, for example, with Euro uh, or China or the UK, um, there is a lot of room um, for the Fed uh, to expand uh, the monetary policy. And um, another thing that I have in mind is um, the threat. Uh, the threat index is the Kansas City financial stress index uh, and um, I can't show this this chart for now but uh, some of you guys uh, that are looking here um, might have a look to this the threat index is for the stress test is at the moment near zero that means um, the US financial system has absolutely zero stress at the moment with the situation that we have um, with, with the with the cheaper um, or weaker dollar and so I'm pretty sure um, that's a good sign uh, for for the U.S. And we have um, and now on the on the on the other side, uh, when we have a look to the total assets of the uh, Federal Reserve in July, we had um, a balance sheet in worth of 6.96 trillion U.S. dollar in July 2020, uh, and we have uh, projections uh, to um, the year 20. It's I think it's 28. That means eight year in future, um, we will see um, probably uh, the asset of the of the Federal Reserve to 19 trillion. Um, that what we see in the future. Uh, and when we see this way, we see a lot of money going out um, into the world. They print it uh, in this in this case. And um, I'm pretty sure this is the way um, the Fed will go for the future. And this will um, weaken the US dollar. And uh, this has um, impacts to the other um, um, large uh, major um, currency systems. And uh, this is what we see um, at the moment. For example, when you have a look to Euro US dollar, it's increasing in the chart. It's, it's an uptrend. You see the same uh, when we have a look to the cable, British pound, uh, US dollar. It's the same thing. We're trending up, not, not in a straight way. It's volatile. Uh, but uh, I think um, this, these things that, that the Fed um, are doing is in the moment um, brings all together to weaken the dollar for the short term future. And this is what we trader from the traders view have to have in mind. Um, the trends are against the US dollar. And this is um, what we see. And we can, uh, yeah, get advantages of this. Yes, so, Shu, are you going to take the other side of the trade here? We've got four dollar bears. They're prepared to uh, supply with as many dollars as you need, my man. Do we have a bid? <laughs> I wish I wish I could. Um, I mean, I, I kind of, um, you know, uh, Carlos kind of stole uh, my thunder out there. Um, it was pretty much uh, what Carlos said. Uh, you can you can have as much stimulus as you like, um, but it's not creating jobs. Um, and unless you create jobs, you're not going to stimulate the economy. Uh, let's face it. I mean, stimulus is more socialistic. Um, and most of the economies these days are capitalistic. And um, it, it's completely against the ethos of capitalistic economies to go socialist. Um, and, and that's not going to create jobs. So whilst we are not creating jobs, um, the economies are not going to go up. And so therefore, the dollar is going to be bearish. Unfortunately, I can't take the other side of the trade at this stage. Well, it's left um, unless Unless I have a very hard, uh, very, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe the volatility might allow me to do it around the election uh, day, but uh, other than that, in a long and a near term view, I think um, 
we all kind of tend to agree on the same page. Okay, okay. Well, um, last but not least, let's think about uh, risk markets in terms of the, the indexes and uh, an overall risk sentiment. Um, whilst history has shown that party leadership in the Oval Office has had little long-term impact on market returns, uh, markets do expect, like we've just been discussing, some near-term volatility around the election. Excluding, interestingly, the economic boom of the 1990s under the Clinton administration and the subsequent dot-com bubble burst under George W. Bush, market returns have actually proven to be similar across party leadership. However, with this election, a democratic clean sweep is the rising chance of this election outcome, mainly because of, out of all possible outcomes, a blue wave implies the largest potential changes to the legislative environment for global companies, which could result in significant impacts for both domestic and international markets. Perceptions are obviously scarred by the polls of 2016 that were wrong on both Brexit and the Trump presidency, but historically speaking, polls have only been wrong twice since 1952. So have the polls got it wrong again? Or regardless of, of, of the presidency, it's obvious that beyond the pandemic, the US presidential election is expected to be the one of the key market drivers for Q4. So what are your current market expectations and what is your view? Do you buy a post-election dip or do you sell a post-election rip? Desmond. Well, well, my view was a, it's a lot more regarding the polls, right? Because I, 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 I have a very, I guess, interesting perspective on it, right? It, it seems that it's a little bit too clear, right? It's, it, it seems that, you know, that there, there, there might be some, to me, there might be some kind of a uh, that, that little part of me is always questioning, you know, is it really so easy that everyone is question, you know, is predicting a, a Biden win, right? So, so anyway, there's one interesting statistic, which actually borrows its roots from the whole efficient market hypothesis, right? And it accurately predicted who won the elections correctly 20 out of 23 times uh, since 1936. Right. Um, well, of course, you know, we are in unprecedented times, right? And, um, and this might be different, right? But this statistic is a little bit hard to ignore, right? Um, and we all know that the efficient market hypothesis, right? Basically, it says that, you know, the, the equity markets are basically priced in uncertainty, right? So this particular statistic is that if the S&P 500 index is up in the three months prior to the election day, the incumbent party usually wins, right? And if the markets are down during that period, the opposing party typically claims a victory, right? And yeah, of course, you know, it's, um, uh, what do you call it? You know, it, it borrows from the whole efficient market hypothesis, you know, um, but, but it, it basically means that the equity markets have already priced in this uncertainty. So um, amidst all this madness that we're seeing, right? You know, could, could it be that yes, um, you know, it's all, what's the word for it, right? <laughs> it, it's it's hard to put a finger on it, yeah. But, but, but yeah, you know, basically as of today, you know, S&P is up about 4% since, uh, since August 3rd, which is three months prior to election day. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, it's just really, really food for thought for me, right? On this whole, um, it just seems a little bit too obvious, right? And, and yeah, you know, it was obvious before, you know, uh, and and you know that could be it could be a potential upset here, right? But it's a very long shot for me. Yeah. Interesting, Carlos. Buy the dip or sell the rip? <laughs> sell the sell the rally, of course, all day long, my friend Patrick. Not yet, but the crash is coming sooner or later. Gravity is gonna make effect. The companies has been uh, they have been uh, not having uh, profits since two years ago, 2018. This crisis is not the COVID crisis. The COVID make it bigger and stronger, but the crisis was already cooking in the oven for already two years already, in my opinion. For me, um, I have two points to address here for the stocks. First of all, uh, it's overbought. It's okay. It's an uptrend. I will not go and sell right now. Guys, take a lot of care. Okay, always. It's not like I'm not saying it's going to fall tomorrow. But um, two points I want to address. The first point is that 
There are many zombies companies in USA. The Fed are creating these kind of companies where they uh, get more debt to pay more debt all the time, asking for loans to pay more debt. At the moment, the rating agencies lower their uh, qualification from uh, AAA from uh, to B, triple B or B mi minus B, they will have a lot of problem to get more debt at, as a, with a good price. So uh, this plus um, the, we, the earnings of the companies are going like this. For me, I'm berries. This is one of the main points. And the second point for me, I have been using an indicator for a fundamental indicator for a lot of time, for a long time. It's the total market cap by the GDP, gross domestic product in USA, in the market. In USA, you have nearly 6,000 companies you can invest on them in the stock market, okay? The total market cap of the money that is uh, already invested in this company, it's like 180% of the GDP of USA, okay? It's highly leveraged, very highly, highly leveraged. So what happens is at the moment, these companies, the earnings start to be low and low and low and low, and some people start to take profit. And I see that you are taking profits and everybody uh, are taking profits. It can generate a domino effect. Uh, basically, uh, the leverage is gonna go down. <clears throat> we are gonna have some um, deleveraging years coming uh, forward, or we keep like crazy buying air and then the crash will be even bigger. So I am very, I, I expect the market to go down the, the stocks S&P 500 because these two uh, things, first of all, is overbought, look at it. <laughs> the companies are going out, but it's only five companies going out. There are 495 companies that are not going <laughs> out. Only five companies are going, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla. I mean, <laughs> tell me other company that is going out. No, And then the total market cap by the GDP is insane levels the maximum we ever saw these are my points thank you guys good stuff mike yes here i am <laughs> so the ripple by the tip i'm a bull i'm a long-term bull um so for the long term i would um i would prefer to buy um the dip the question is when will we see the dip yeah. <laughs> did we see the dip um now uh, and we will see increase in markets or will we get a lot of volatility um, after the election um, and uh, the COVID-19 um, will play a big role in the uh, economy development of the USA. Uh, Carlos said a few very good points um, that a lot of uh, companies are not able um, to, um, to uh, receive uh, further future um, gains. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, but I think... Um, uh, to bring this together with the um, uh, monetary policy of the Fed. Um, we have um, different points of view. Uh, and in my opinion, um, the modern market theory is it's a really good working thing. We, um, we have seen this in 2008 um, with the financial crisis. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Fed uh, made printed a lot of money um, to help the companies and uh, and and the US economy and um, they prevented um, the worst case and this is what we see at the moment and they expanded the, this program because of it's at the moment not only for companies um, also um, the US citizens are, are able to get money um, uh, from from the from from the not really from the Fed but uh, they got money uh, with the triple free program and um, uh, the uh, the um, I'm not really sure um, how you call this and um, they got um, uh, when you have no job you got money the from acts. the cares yes acts. that's yeah. it absolutely thank you Patrick um, and these are the things uh, when we see money will help the economy in short term and they hope uh, that the the money uh, will bring the growth for the future. And for this reason, um, I'm the opinion in long term, we will see um, an upcoming bull market and we will see um, um, 
a change in the market uh, from the old economy to the new economy, where people have a look to um, more uh, to do more things in the internet, uh, to have a sustainable energy system, and so on. We see this on the car market, for example, with Tesla uh, and the energy producers. We will have more and more green energy, and these are the things that will bring. Um, the growth for the future and um, always well, when we have uh, so situations uh, like we have now, um, um, then is the, the whole industry is changing at the moment and um, not only COVID-19, also the election may be um, a catalyst for, for future changes and this is what I think we see here. So in my opinion, when I have, to uh, when I have the chance to buy the dip, um, whenever it comes for the long term, I would really like to buy the dip. When we have a lot of volatility during the election, and this is what um, the short term trader are interested in, it's really important um, to see uh, what the markets are playing. And what we see at the moment is a lot of certainty. That means at the moment uh, we will have to sit, uh, we have the situations um, that uh, short term traders sell the rip. That means they sell to higher prices. Every day when the markets go up, we will see sellings. And this is a sign for me that we have at the moment the situation when we sell the rip. And um, this is the thing what I have at the moment when we have the high volatility and the uncertainty, um, who will win the election? Um, we will see that the markets will sell the rip in short term. And this is uh, what I think it's a better idea always to sell the rips. But when we see the market is changing, now the short-term traders are switching over from selling the rip to buy the dip. It's time for the short-term traders to do the same. And this is where we have to have an eye uh, what the uh, big boys are doing uh, and uh, we um, private traders have to follow them. That's, that's the secret. Good stuff. So we've got uh, Desmond sitting on the fence. We've got Carlos uh, selling the rip. We've got... Uh, Mike is selling the rip to buy the dip. Joseph, where are you? <laughs> Patrick, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Mike and Carlos and the guys. I have like two scenarios, the classical one and the technical part, like fundamentally speaking, uh, we cannot but mention again the taxation, right? Um, higher capital gains tax that could accompany a win by the Democrats would be a potential maybe a counter counterweight on this year's powerful uh, rally in the stock market. So uh, actually, I don't think the Democrats are being forthright with the policies they are uh, prescribing with the Green New Deal, with the Supreme Court, with the new tax policy, policy both on, on, on corporate and individual. So basically, I, I still believe that if the Democrats win the White House and both the chambers of Congress at the election next month, we could see we could see a drop in the in the S P 500 and the Dow Jones at least five percent. This is the classical view, let's say, all right? The fundamental view, the normal classical thought uh, of taxation and and the correlation with the stock market. However, like if we need to elaborate more in, in terms of technical view, the market V shaped recovery was fast and full of momentum. So we saw the SP 500 trade uh, and uh, traded a, a new record high after the flash crash took place. So the, and the current levels of the American indices are holding near all-time highs, which gives the the upside uh, momentum a higher probability to happen. So if I if I would like to agree with with Carlos, I would stress on a point that even if we we need to sell the rip, I would like to see a bounce and a higher uh, uh, let's say maybe a false breakout. You can you can uh, name it, but I, I would like to see a higher indices um, uh, post election before any sell off uh, might happen. Both any like even if the Democrats at least uh, like uh, win, we we could see another bounce before a, a crash. Uh, Joseph, completely uh, like, agree with you. For the technical pattern, uh, Carlos, if you if you know that after a V shape, after a V. Uh, uh, v letter, we expect an I. So basically, it's a V and then an I. It's the same, actually. So we might see another crash in the market happening. So I couldn't agree more with you, but like uh, we need to see maybe one more high before selling up. Okay, last but not least, and we all know you shouldn't trade when you're tired. 
So sure, I think it's about 1 a.m. with you. So I wouldn't be uh, pressing any buy or sell buttons directly, but what's your view, Shu? Buy the dip or sell the rip? Um, I think the market's already factored in. Um, uh, like Desmond came in and said, you know, it's, it's, it's too good to be true. The market's already factored everything in. Um, so I'd wait till the 3rd of November um, and maybe a bit beyond um, if, Trump remains, I'm bullish, bullish all the way. Um, you know, just buy, buy, buy. Um, you know, uh, the markets are, I mean, let's face it, he is a businessman first and, uh, you know, a leader second. Um, so, but should um, he lose and, um, you know, once he gives up the office, um, I think it's around the 10th of January that he would be forced to give up the office unless he contests um, things. Um, that's when, uh, during that period of um, volatility, um, you know, there will be opportunities um, to sell. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we might see, uh, you know, Further, further down the track, um, what the new administration brings in. But um, there is no harm in the US dollar being uh, weaker. Good. Okay. Well, look, guys, thank you very much for your time um, and your contributions and input to, to the core questions there. Um, I think we've probably got about uh, 10 or 15 minutes here where we could open the floor up for some Q&A. So if anyone has a specific question regarding the, the topics we've discussed, if you want to type that into the chat box, or I think we've got a Q&A box as well, and I can, uh, I can feed those back into the group. Um, we've got Alejandro from Colombia. How does the uh, new president of the United States give the economy, um, how, how does the management of the economy um, in the United States impact emerging economies in relation to the debt they have on GDP and the printing of dollars by the Fed. It's clear that a weak dollar would help pay the external debts of smaller countries, but what would be the outlook in a more global context? Who'd like to jump in on that? Uh, Mike is speaking um, just a few words to this. Uh, we have uh, to have in mind uh, the uh, USA is uh, the largest um, economy in our world. Um, and as long as um, the engine um, is on, on a high term, so um, we have a good US economy, um, this would be good for the overall um, economy. And this is, uh, this is the thing where I would like to say, uh, when um, the US economy is shrinking, uh, we will have an overall problem. We see this, for example, from my point in Germany, um, the export rates, um, we are export champions in, in, in our world. Uh, and we see the problems that we have um, when um, the global economy is shrinking and we have huge problems with our exports uh, and this affects our our whole economy um, and in this uh, in this point I would say as long as we have a relative strong um, US economy um, we will have also a relative uh, strong Chinese economy um, and this would be uh, good uh, for the overall economy in our world. I'm specifically though, thinking about in terms of emerging markets and I guess in, in terms of debt management for for those economies, um, obviously, when we have the dollar surging, it puts them under significant pressure, as we had seen uh, over the past couple of years. And that then has additional impacts in terms of stressing uh, economies such as Brazil and, um, and the like. So I think in terms of the, the specific emerging economies, like the panel seem to agree here, a weaker dollar should actually, um, should actually be supportive of those economies, obviously, um, it uh, reduces their debt burden significantly and means that, uh, I mean, it means that there's more capital available. So um, I think the, the view here from the panel, who are mostly uh, dollar bears, would be that, uh, that the emerging markets could see, uh, could see a bumper, bumper period ahead of them. Uh, any other questions? Let me just quickly scroll through. 
Uh, question for you all. Um, I try to see the situation more simply. This is from Daniel. Um, don't you see the US economy near to a collapse and this COVID plus elections is just a theater and even causing more damage in the long run? Will either Trump or Biden be able to avoid the crash? I think Carlos is our Uber bear. Um, what's your view on that, Carlos? <laughs> Can either Biden or Trump ride to the rescue of the US economy? I'm not sure. I, I have, you know, we as a traders, we always like to do question to question things. And I agree with you guys, with Desmond, with Sue, you have very, and Joseph, Mike, all my colleagues, uh, do have very valid points. And I have even myself some contradictions like, okay, you see a weak dollar, this will be good for stocks. No, it's like I'm very stocks, but I'm also very dollar. It doesn't make too much sense, I know, but <laughs> sometimes that's the, the things no, we encounter. In my opinion, uh, it's the beginning of the end of the competitiveness of USA as in the old way, like as Mike said, new economies, new digital, uh, I think the Fed is, is working for the uh, digital dollar, no? Interbank yeah. dollar, right? Yeah. Europe is also preparing, the central banks are preparing this jump into the next stage, economy 4.2 or whatever beta version it is, no? But um, what I mean is that I don't see, Daniel, this is the end of the war, like, oh, it's a crash in USA, it's going to end USA. It's going to change. It's going to be a big and huge change, in my opinion, of the economy, and it will maybe come with a crash. So in my, in my opinion, this crash is unstoppable. It doesn't matter if it's Trump or if it's Biden, because it's going all around Europe. For me, the crash means that companies that are not competitive, they will need to be out of business and then new companies will appear. So it will make, it will generate a transfer of value from non-valuable companies that are not providing anything to the society to new companies that will be uh, already, uh, many people are creating new companies for this new economy, everything digital, online, share uh, economy, we share the car, we share the bike, you know, these kind of new companies that are going all over the world in the big cities. So this is how I see more or less. <laughs> okay, it's an interesting point actually about um, the digital currencies. And that, this has kind of been something that's been under the radar of many people. But um, if we think in terms of, I guess, what, what a digital, the immediate impact of a digital currency and how that will impact nearly every single one of us is certainly with the, you know, the, the huge amount of funds that these global economies have had to put into defending the economies um, through expenditure, then um, the only way that they're really going to recoup this, this expense is, is taxation. And certainly a, a, if, if, if currencies become fully digitized, it's going to be very easy for um, governments or central banks to apply uh, these tax regimes and um, you know the days of offshore banking and all the rest of it will be a, will be a thing of the past, and taxation will occur directly from your your bank account, um, ostensibly. So you know that's one of the things that could be could be coming down the pike here in terms of uh, a significant impact in terms of allowing governments to recoup all this uh, all this pandemic expenditure. Um, another question here with regards to emerging market currencies and specifically if Biden wins and specifically for the Turkish economy. We know that the, uh, the lira has been under significant pressure um, and the US dollar is trading at about 820 against the lira at the moment. Uh, and so does anyone have a view on, on the lira and if Biden gets in, how uh, you know, that could impact the, uh, the dollar versus the, the Turkish lira? Anyone want to chime in on that? Um, I can tell a few uh, from my point to the charts. We've traded um, the lira um, versus the euro and the US dollar here um, in Tickmer, Germany. Uh, and I can tell you what, um, uh, have a look to the chart. Um, when you see this, said, since months, um, um, the, the Turkish lira is uh, going down and down and down. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure this has nothing to do uh, with, with the US economy. Um, the uh, Turkey has huge economic problems. And as long as these problems are not yet solved, um, you will see uh, a weak, uh, a weak um, Turkish lira. This is, this is my opinion. And I'm pretty sure um, if Biden will win or Trump will uh, stay in the White House, it will not change. Good stuff. In my opinion, Patrick, uh, the, 
no doubt that uh, Trump uh, winning the election again would like continue to escalate the tensions in the Middle East. So basically, Biden like uh, would rather uh, maybe uh, work in, a, in Obama's like mentality. Maybe it would be rather more deals, more peace deals in the Middle East, less tensions. The USDTRY, the lira, is uh, tension driven, but not like from the, uh, uh, technically. But however, I have like certain critical numbers inside, which is the 8.36 level, which is the 161.8 Fibonacci retracement level we did the calculations and the technical analysis. So basically the 8.36 level reminds me of the seventh level of the uh, Chinese yuan against the US dollar. So it's a pivotal number and very critical level. I believe we are in the final and the fifth wave of this, uh, of this upside momentum. So probably we might see at least a three wave pullback as a corrective wave before any continuation of the trend might happen. So the five or the sixth level is already like in the market. We can see it again very fast anytime soon. Good stuff. Okay, well, one thing for certain, we're in the fifth wave of this election and we are heading towards the results a week from tomorrow, potentially. Um, once again, I'd like to thank all the panelists, Shu, Joseph, Mike, Carlos and Desmond. And from myself, thank you very much for attending. I hope you found this discussion useful and, um, and we will see what, uh, what comes from these elections. So thank you very, thank you very much everyone and uh, good night. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.